Welcome to Write for Joy. I'm Allie Cross. I'm an author and happiness enthusiast. I've chased joy my whole life until one day I realized I already had it. Joy is all around us. So let's see if we can grab some of it for ourselves today. I'm Allie Cross, and this is Right for Joy. For me. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am joined today with author Lori Lewis, who uh, she, I meant to ask her where you live. Where do you live, Lori? I, I live in Saratoga Springs, Utah right now. Okay, because her first line was a bit, it tripped me up a bit when I first read it because so many authors, you know, we start with a award winning or whatever it is we are, but Lori chose to start with a weather whining <laughs> lover of family, God, twinkle lights, yeah. and the sea. And two things, two thoughts about that. Weather whining, completely appropriate as a Utahan, because it is just, it's either like scorching devil hot or whatever. Tell me why you like to whine about the weather in Utah. Well, I mean, I, it's, I've been a weather whiner since Maryland. I've only been in oh. Utah three years. I think, oh. though, uh, I think I'm so gifted at it that I could whine about weather anywhere, you know? Even at like, the sea? Because, <laughs> no. you know, like, maybe not at the sea. Maybe not there. Oh, but, not no. in my I'm heaven. from Nova Scotia, and the oh. sea is quite bitter and cold. Like, you could go to the beach at Nova Scotia, but unless you're on that one special day a year when it's warm... It's generally a very cold experience. But there's something romantic about the sea mist blowing your hair and the there wind. There sure is. But now you're in landlocked Utah. That's true. That's true. What do you well, do? It's, it's like sometimes it's like last year, literally, we'd say every because we were in a drought and we'd say every day, another beautiful day in Saratoga. It was like very annoying because we wanted rain so bad. So I was whining because it was beautiful and sunny and hot. And then, um, and, and then if it's, if it's cold, you know, like, oh, it's so cold. I can't believe it's June. And I wrapped in a blanket and we are literally. In yeah, June I'm in Utah place. as well. And this is the weirdest June I think we have ever experienced. This is not a weather whiner too. It's I could have been more of a weather pre like um prejudice, whatever, because nothing is ever as nice as Canada in uh, my mind, which is where I'm I'm from. Not uh, okay. Nova Scotia so more so much, but like Ontario, the the forests and the lakes, like I grew up in the Thousand Lakes region. So like upper Michigan, you know, oh, it's so yeah. beautiful, so beautiful up there. That's how Maryland is very, very green. Yes. So much water when you fly over, it's just all, all you see are green and water and then you land yeah. and then you see the cities, but um, it was so humid. So I'd whine about the humidity in Maryland. This is out true. Here, I miss the green, but the mountains are beautiful. So I kind of think every place is beautiful, but will that stop me from whining? probably not completely <laughs> yeah when my family we went home to Ontario when my boys were 16 so this was a few years ago and first of all none of us suffered from allergies while we were in Canada and the air was just so fresh and clean feeling it was amazing but then all four of us the moment we stepped out of the airport into like it was August or something. So it was like burning heat. We all took another deep breath because, oh, it felt so good to be out of the humidity yeah. because it was only like 80 degrees or whatever in Toronto, but we were dying because you couldn't breathe. The air was so thick with humidity and everything. So, I know. I so, know. You know, every I place, know. but we are now in Utah. Therefore, Utah is awesome. Yeah. So let me tell everyone more about you. Okay. So I love that uh, Lori says that she's a terrible crafter, but oh. she is she is creative. So she turned her her attentions to writing, and it turns out that writing is actually a good place for her 
because she's been quite prolific. Uh, she has 15 novels out across multiple genres, which I also love because I mean, like, I admire people who can keep it going across like the different parts of themselves because that's hard work. Um, it's not a surprise that she's a history junkie and therefore writes some historical, wait, I'm looking to see, is it historical romance that you write or is it general historical fiction? A little of both. Okay. A little of both. Yeah. Because, you know, she grew up in that DC, Baltimore, Phil Philadelphia sort of area. So, so mm -hmm. rich with American history for sure. Do you write primarily? American history when you write your historical books? Well, I wrote a five book historical fiction series called Free Men and Dreamers, which was based on the War of 1812, which is very rich in that area, you know, Baltimore, the Battle of Baltimore, the burning of Washington. And it was coming up on the, um, the bicentennial year of that event. And so I start and I but I was also teaching early morning seminary and we were doing doctrine and covenant so I was learning about the history of the church so I anyway oh. I kind of just merged I noticed all these crossovers and I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna look at history through a, a slightly different lens and really drill down on the people and how the events affected people and it made it so rich and beautiful so that five book series free men and dreamers is definitely American history with um, a, a definitely a religious overtone about how the, this religious tumult going on was making people um, have have questions and faith was an important part of their patriotism also. So What's anyway, the name that, of that? oh oh sorry, you said free men, free and men and dreamers. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that was my five book historical fiction start. I did that one. And then I backed away from that and did a few more uh, like women's fiction romance kind of books. And then I um, have been spent, I spent eight years working on the latest historical novel, which is this one. Uh, Wait, let, we'll look back a little letter, bit so we can see it. The Letter Carrier. Oh, nice. Got, and, you gotta hold it like right in front of you so that the blur, your background, filter doesn't get it Let's hold it up okay. a little higher hold it up higher so we can see it oh so it's like but like war time with airplanes and stuff very cool world war ii and did we i found this one I, I wrote this one because i found a little woman sitting in a nursing home and she started telling me her story and it was so amazing so um again very people oriented i think um i'm very character driven when i write and so this book has been a real joy. And there's an interesting story to that. So I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about it, but <laughs> really interesting story about how it came to be and what the impact of the book has been on the family of the woman who's the basis. Yeah. It's very cool. So, I mean, you, everyone who's listening can already hear that, hear your intelligence and your um, empathy for these people of the past. Um, I can't wait to read because I love character driven novels are my favorite. Um, I think they're pretty much of transplanted plot driven stories as a favorite for readers today in general. But I want everyone to know that this woman we're talking to is a multi award winning author. So many things I, and I put it all in the show notes, but, um, it's very impressive. So I'm very oh. honored and glad to have you as a guest. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I feel the same way about you. So I thought, <laughs> Allie Cross wants to interview me. Oh, we're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like to fool people into thinking stuff. <laughs> but I am really glad. I love this little podcast and show. And so I'm really glad you're here because... I am kind of obsessed with happiness and joy. I feel really passionate about it. Obviously, that's why I'm here. And I didn't ever know that I needed this almost, it's because it feels almost like an experiment or a study in people and 
the things that bring them joy. I did not know that that's what I was really doing here. And it's been amazing. So I am excited to learn from you a little bit. So I know I put you on the spot when I told you I was going to ask you this is I did not prep you for it. But how, what does joy mean to you, Lori? And how would you describe it? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, I think in this two and a half minutes, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> I think for me, joy is a is a happiness that has a positive impact on people, whether it's myself or the people I'm with. But um, I think joy is it's it's the lasting happiness, but it almost always has a positive impact on on people, and I'm thinking of that in terms of the difference between um, somebody coming to visit and whether they bring a gift or not. You know, the gift is temporary and not, not important at all, but the visit, the time, the the sharing. And I think joy often changes us. You know, it's it has wrought a change in our being, whether it's more uh, greater empathy or growth, joy doesn't always come from easy means um a lot of times joy does comes from a hard road you know it's the reward at the end of a hard road um and that's probably why it's so sweet because it's not doesn't come easily sometimes you know so it's hard for me to talk about joy without talking about faith um and i would i would be interested to talk to someone who who is agnostic or whatever, because for me, it is so wrapped up in this kind of feeling that I can have joy because I have faith in a being greater than me. So that even though life happens and it's try, you know, trials and tribulations and such, you can still have this overriding kind of like you're saying, like the, the visit, the time, as compared to the the fleeting thing of happiness, because yeah. we can be happy for a moment, but joy is what it's what keeps it's to me it's very entangled with faith. So yeah. oh, um, I I agree I agree hundred percent. I I appreciate you saying that because I feel like um, the the uh, need to lean on on my heavenly father on my savior, they need to lean on them is part of that hard road. When you just realize I can't do this by myself. I can't carry this by myself, but you, you get through it and you realize it's because you were leaning heavily on yeah. them, probably recognizing it along the way. But at the end, then, then this beautiful gift opens up, you know, like so many times you think, why does this have to happen? Why? And you just can see after a while that these slight course changes happening in your life to get you to this beautiful place that you need to be to receive whatever it is that he is waiting for you. And so the faith during those little course corrections can be a tough road, a hard road. Right. And in the end, though, it's so rich and so lasting, you know. Right. Yeah, it's like that rainbow, except for it doesn't go away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. To live in the shadow of the rainbow, or I don't know, does a shadow cat, does a rainbow cast a shadow? I don't know. Um, it's probably light. But so I, uh, we already have an idea of where you find joy in your writing because it was so, it just, it just came out of you when you were talking about these people's stories and, and everything. But where do you find joy in your writing, Lori? Well, I, I love to hear readers tell me that the book changed them or touched them. I, I like being able to say they and, and entertain them. I mean, that's great. But when someone tells me that it stayed, the story stayed with them or that it changed them or that it um, they could relate to it, that that brings me joy as a writer after the, the fact. When I'm writing, I don't know, I just love that quote. I think uh, Diederik Uchberg said that we are all creators, children of a creator, you know. And I love that he said that. And I just, 
I just think um, I'm not a visually gifted person. I, I can't, I can't figure out what rug to put with what sofa. <laughs> I can't figure out what paint tone to put on the walls. As you can see, it's all neutral. But, um, but when I, I don't know, when I write, I feel like I tap into something to this, this gift that was given to me so that I could share, you know, so I could bring joy or so I can relate to other people. That's the other thing I find. I'm sure that's the true with you and you write your beautiful books that when you you're tapping into a topic or a theme that, you know, is personal to some readers and you start to explore that. And then all of a sudden you are walking someone else's journey, you know, and there's so much, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And you are getting tears. <laughs> yeah. And there's so much joy in that walk. And there's so much joy in hearing later on that you, you, you got it right. And that it meant something to someone. Yeah. So it's from the beginning to the end, it just makes me happy as I know it does you as well. Yeah, that was, that was very touching and beautiful. Thank you for that. I'm sure that that love shows up in your books. I loved that you said that it's great for someone to love your book and to be entertained and everything. But I agree that it's those moments when a person says, you know, I remember when I was a um, a new member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I was pretty much um, had a chip on my shoulder that no one, when I came to Utah, where there are a lot of members of this church, um, I felt like it, there was a lot of sugariness, a lot of like, everybody had lived a perfect life, you know, like that's how it felt from my young woman, because I didn't become a member until I was 21. Um, and I read a book by Julie Wright, in which, um, shoot, I can't, I believe that her character decides to have an abortion or something like that. It's It's been like 20, almost 30 years, whatever, since I read that book. <laughs> and I didn't know Julie and I wasn't a writer at the time. Um, but I wrote her afterward, um, the first time I've ever like reached out to an author, which I've now learned is like gold. gold. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, like, Total also, gold. Now that I like totally rocked her world for a moment because I wrote her and said, and I've always felt like I assumed she had not been a lifelong member of the church. I assumed, like I assumed all these things. And so when I read this book and I felt like, wow, you must be a convert. You must have lived my life. And she hadn't. Yeah. But she had been able to, she had, you know, she was a person. She had people she knew and loved in her life. And, but there is this, and I believe, I don't know if it's Elder Uchtdorf's quote or if it's like, if it's the extension of the quote, but like that when we create, we're kind of, working with the creator and and sometimes I feel like magic happens that I feel like Julie felt in that moment and and like you've probably felt where even if we have not experienced that thing we can oftentimes not all the time so we're gonna get stuff wrong but sometimes when we're really in sync we can write truth even though we have not experienced it. And um, I think that that's a, a brilliant and amazing thing. And then when someone like I did with Julie comes back around and says, you got it right. And for the first time I saw myself in an LDS perspective kind of thing, which I had been struggling to find where I fit with all yeah. my sharp corners and you know, baggage and everything, because I didn't think anybody else would understand. And here was this writer who I did not know, who wrote a story that resonated with me. And um, I, I think that moment when you can meet someone and you, you know, and they know that you got it. To me, that being seen is so profound. 
yeah, uh, yeah. for the reader and for me. But it, do, do you find, though, knowing that whether it's conscious or not, you're sort of chasing that transformative, resonant moment with a stranger, um, do you find that you put more pressure on the stories you write to be of that kind of depth and quality? Or do you feel that this is your gift and you you have that and it will find the right person kind of thing? Well, I'm usually a book is inspired by someone, a story, an event. I mean, um, I love how I, I, one of my favorite things to do is to explore how books are born. And all, all of my books, I can trace them back to the moment of their birth, um, where that idea was first planted in my brain. But then, so I, I, I I'm so glad that um, we're, you know, talking you and including faith in here i didn't know how deeply we could go in that that I, is i guess we'll find out what the read you know what listeners think but i'm a faith my life is built on that so it's kind of hard to avoid it i know i didn't know i have to have generic terms to describe these feelings so i will just talk to you straight so yeah i whenever i whenever i write anything that underlying idea of how can I use this to lift someone, to bring them closer to Christ? That is always in every book. They, it might not be overtly a Christian-themed book or an LDS-themed book, but um, I, as my overarching thought is, how will, how will reading this open a light or a portal for people to increase their faith in Jesus Christ and his love for them, to feel hope and to feel his love for them? So that... So whatever I'm writing, that is always my first thought. And um, I, I, my children will read these. My grandchildren will read these. Other people read these. So I want my testimony of Jesus Christ and my testimony of my Father in Heaven to to shine in every book, whether it's very, very overt or whether it's just that, that spiritual lift. Yeah. So that's my first thing. And then the second thing is almost every book is I, there's a person that I uh, have met or has crossed my path that is kind of the person I'm writing to or about. If anybody else finds their way to that story and says, oh, that's my story, I want, I'm, and I'm so thrilled by that, but it's usually a truth of my observance or understanding of someone's life or life experience, much like Julie probably with that book you described, you know? Yeah. And um, so that's kind of where I come from. Those those two directions, you know, like the, the underlying, you know, firmament of faith and this desire to to touch, to lift, to leave somebody feeling hopeful. And then the idea that, that something's going to grow out of this. It's going to touch a certain a person with a certain need today, you know, and um and that's kind I of where actually think that, you know, in marketing, we're supposed, well, not just in marketing, we're supposed to kind of know who our ideal reader is and to our, you know, and even some trainers and educators will go so far as to say to like create, create an actual person. And, um, and you're doing that, but not, but in a very real way. And I was imagining what it would feel like as you were speaking, I was imagining what it would feel like to write a book for someone instead of this sort of broad shouting into a vast empty space, I'm writing for just anyone, you know? I think that for one thing, it would make it much easier to, to sell the book, you know? We're writers, we gotta talk to this. Um, to sell it because you very clearly know who your audience is it's this person and chances are there are many of the that person you know um but also the i can i think it would feel amazing to be writing for someone because it would help your writing and your storytelling stay 
very on point, like the clarity of your message. And, um, you know, we write good books. We don't just write message books. We write great, entertaining stories. So I don't want to get like anybody think, oh, I don't like message books or whatever. Um, The good writers can write a message book in a fantastically entertaining stories. Um, and I, obviously, I'm sure that that's what Lori, what you are doing, because you're writing a story of transformation and um, redemption. Those are my favorite books, redemption stories where, you know, we all need redemption sometimes, you know, we all we all beat ourselves up because we could have done something better, said something better, been kind or been more lovely, missed an opportunity and um, and I just I love redemption stories, whether they're huge redemptions or just the small like yeah. stop getting out of my own way kind of stories, you know. So those are those are my favorites. But again, they're not overt. They're not. It's not like a big message. It's just like in real life, this is what we do. We try to we try to get better, better tomorrow than today better today than yesterday, you know, try to get a little better. And that journey, that very human journey of just trying to not keep making the same mistake over and over again, you know, is a great, that alone is a great story. Then you throw in some other elements and then you've got a very real human book, you know? So, um, but I, I mean, like when I did the letter carrier, so I'll just hold this up one more time. The letter carrier. You gotta put it like where your face would go. Uh, okay, there you go. We got a glimpse of it. It's because of the filter. Because the uh, filter you oh, have it's gonna is zoom like, in. Uh, yeah. only looks for faces. So, but we got a glimpse of it. But so the letter carrier originally was not going to be a novel. I, I met this woman in a nursing home. She was, my mom had dementia. And she was in an assisted living center. And so on on one of my visits to her, I found this teeny little woman sitting beside her. And my mom was so happy that day. And I thought, oh, my mom has a friend today, you know, because some she won't remember her tomorrow. But right now she has this friend she's talking to. So uh, I, my mom grew up in the World War II age as a child. She remembered the deprivations of war. She remembered... Um, you know, food stamps and rations and all that stuff. And so when I I knew this woman was roughly my mom's age, but then when I heard her voice and saw that it was very thick French, I thought, oh, you have a story to tell. And she said, well, I've tried to tell my story many times, but I, I can't, it's just too hard. And I said, well, I will help you. And my goal originally was to get her story down for her family she, you know, so she could share it with her family, but, um, that we started interviewing, talking to for over three years, I would drive, she, she got, she got injured and had to be moved to West Virginia. And so now it was a little bit of a, of a journey for me to get to her, but, um, I would go down once a month and her daughter would come too. I had to get her daughter's permission and I would interview her. I would record our little conversations and then I would bring the pieces back and try to put her story together, but it became so apparent that this story was more compelling was, it was, it was so compelling that it needed to be told because, and she wanted it to be told. She used to speak at schools and colleges and then nobody wanted to talk about the war anymore. And she felt like there were things that she learned that she wanted the world to hear again. So I, um, Anyway, that's how this started. It was an eight-year project and while I was doing wow. other books. But um, it was during the pandemic when we I did a lot of the writing on it. And um, so, yeah, that was this is a book I wrote specifically for one person. And I could hear her voice in my head. And I could see her expressions. And I could visualize her mannerisms. And so writing her in this book was she writing her was easy because I knew this person very well, you know, but then writing things that happened to her was hard because it was like putting myself there with her. And it was, those were hard pages to write, you know, but, um, so yeah, I have that, that unique experience of writing a book for one person is, it is a unique experience. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Cool. 
and um, th this novel that Lori's talking about has just recently come out in the last year, and she just won um, Best General Fi General Historical Fiction Whitney Award and the Novel of the Year. Congratulations, Lori! Thank you. Thank you for the Whitney Awards, and I didn't this year. So had I gone, I could have celebrated you. But um, that's a, that, that's a wonderful accomplishment. That's a competitive genre in in the Whitney's so good for you thank I, um, you I think that it sounds like something it would it would be wonderful to read that book so thank you for bringing it out into the world I'm sure her family is grateful as well to have this piece of their mom kind of brought to life that's beautiful yeah. has she the did, did she live long enough to see it published not to see it published. I, I ended up self-publishing it because I was shopping it around and I had gotten an offer, but the offer was, um, it, I, I wanted to put a paperback in her hands yeah, and yeah. before she died. And I could see that that was not going to happen with the offer I got. And, and rather than keep the time to shop it around and then get it actually to print, you know, it's such a long process. And I just thought, I'm just going to self-publish this. So I, I have a, dear friend who's an outstanding editor and, and she was pushing me on it uh, during the pandemic when I would get sidetracked and she just said, you know, you got to get on this book. You got to get on this book. And so we got the manuscript into Michelle's hands and she got to see a rough draft of the cover. So she saw it, she knew it was happening um, and she knew the date it was going to be published when it would be out in the world, but she passed away in February and the book came out in July. Last but year. I was going to say that even though you wrote it for this person and for their family initially anyway, obviously it has appeal to readers because the Whitney's are a reader voted um, competition. So you know that you've written a, an amazing story. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. One of the things... I um, loved most about the way this book has been received is that um, it, it's the bringing together of a very personal, beautiful story of a female and her courage. And it's also a story of history that a lot of people don't know very much about because this was uh, taking place in France, but um, it's, it's been a real eye opener to me. It's made me uh, very, more and more grateful than ever before for that World War II generation, for what our grandfathers, you know, sacrificed and what their families sacrificed. And so, I, you know, it, it, it is a book of gratitude, but it had an interesting impact on our family too, because the siblings in the book, we had to get permission from all the family members in order to publish this book. So we wrote to every family member, they're all still in France, and sent them a copy of the manuscript. And um, the comments we got back from them were very touching. They were like, now I know my father. I didn't understand my father because they didn't want to talk about, you know, but now the children understood and they, and they were so proud of their heritage to know that their family had been so brave and so faithful to God through these very hard things so and now all the cousins who were kind of estranged are now all very close and talking and it's just been really fun that's amazing thank you so much for sharing that story with us um it's beautiful and i just love all the heart that you have it's so evident it's like everywhere uh i think i would adore your books if they have even a portion of that heart in them Oh, thank thank you. you, Lori, for being here, for sharing your feelings about joy and the joy you experience in creating stories that go out into the world and that hopefully make someone's life a little better. Thank you so much for that. Is there anything thank else you. you'd like to add before we say goodbye? Oh, I feel like I did when I stood on the Whitney stage with no words to say. <laughs> No, I just really, I appreciate this. It's so, it's so fun to reach readers in any way we can. And I think it's, uh, I think this is a great, great,
great thing to examine writing or whatever gift or talent we have through that film uh, filter of joy because um, we do we do it most of us don't do it because we're going to make a lot of money <laughs> we, we, we it's the joy that's what gets us to the computer and that's what gets us you know through the you know the roadblocks where we can't figure out what to do with our character next you know yeah. and it's oh, yeah. that it's just joy that makes us do that so it totally is and uh, I've been doing this, uh, I think it'll have been like for three months or so, because that's how many interviews that I've now done. And writing is a slog. Uh, I like that word slog because, you know, it's like we, it is hard, but we are moving forward. But there has to be a reason we show up every day. And it's, it can't be just the money or any of the sort of side bits no matter how attractive they might be like a big movie or whatever because those are never present in the actual sitting down to work um, there has to be something in us that pushes us forward and um, and I think you're right you're totally right that it's joy it's that sense of fulfilling a calling or a potential within us so yeah. um, and you were we were talking earlier about family and about being a parent and children and and I feel like um if you want to know a parent look at their children and you'll know so much about the parent you know by the little things the children do and say and I feel like that you, you, when you read an author's book we are in those pages we are in those characters. And so we, we, we don't like to reveal a lot of ourselves <laughs> verbally sometimes, but we are very revealing in the way we write, you know? And so I feel like, um, you know, like the things I, my characters love are usually the things I love and, yep. you know, so yeah. it's, a, it's, well, I think it's, we're all going to want to know you better. So therefore we should all just go read all of your books. <laughs> uh, hey, thanks so much. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lori. And for um, all of you listening or watching, I hope you enjoyed the, the chat today. We'll be back again next week. But in the meantime, go out and grab your joy because it is all around you and just waiting for you to pick it up and claim it. So have a great week, everyone.